Welcome in, everybody, to the CFB Nation All-America podcast presented by Twisted Tea. I'm Bill Trochi, senior editor at SportingNews.com, alongside Bill Bender, our national college football writer at SportingNews.com. Thank you to everyone for listening to this podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And for those of you watching on our YouTube channel at CFB Nation, if you have time to leave a review on Apple, that'd be great. If you'd have time to leave some comments or a like on the YouTube channel, that would be great. Thank you to Irish Breakdown, your source for Notre Dame football information. They have a tremendous lineup of podcasts and great stories at irishbreakdown.com. You can follow Bill on Twitter at BillBender92. And you can follow me at Bill Trochi and keep an eye on the main sporting news account at Sporting News. We, we stand one week from week zero. We started this countdown in January and now, now we're on the brink of it might be an underwhelming Saturday slate to open it up, but it's a slate nonetheless. Um, we have a special guest here at CFB Nation All-America podcast, Joe Rexroad, columnist for The Athletic, who is based in Nashville and covers Tennessee and Vanderbilt out of the SEC He's going to join us to talk some SEC football and maybe a little Michigan football, since that's where uh, he and Mr. Bender first crossed paths. Joe, thank you for uh, making time for us after wrapping up your show at 102.5 The Game in Nashville. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Glad we could do this. Uh, yeah, I've known Bill for a long time, and I, I just found out that you are close friends with Mitch Light, so I'm hoping we can get in some digs on Mitch during this podcast, too. <laughs> Absolutely. Bill, I'll let you kind of review the, the press boxes you've shared with Joe over the years. Yeah, no, uh, Joe, I always tell the story. So this is all the way back to 2003. I was covering an Ohio State, Michigan State game. And after the game it was a Jeff Smoker special for <laughs> Joe that year. Um, and I'm in the post game after and go to the Michigan State side. And Joe is just hammering John L. Smith. And I'm like, I'm not going to get any questions in. And I was this like 22 year old kid getting mad. I was like, who is that guy up there? And then I read his stories the next day. I was like, oh, that guy's really good. So, and then fortunately, when I started at college football with sporting news, started covering, caught these guys up with the Michigan State beat. Those were some really good Michigan State years for Joe. And um, it was a lot of fun. He's good. He's really professional, really good at his job. Great writer, great reporter, everything I respect. And, uh, you know, just an all-around good guy. Did I sell you enough, Joe? Is that good enough? Man, that, yeah, right. no, I, I appreciate it, man. Two, 2003, my goodness. <laughs> uh, we are going back for that, yeah. Well, of course, you know, John L. So, let's see, what was John L.'s, uh, what was his last year? Oh, six. That year, John L. stopped answering my questions after the first game. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know you if you were. That. You probably, yeah, you probably weren't around that team much. They were terrible. But, um, yeah, that last year got a little contentious. But you know what, John? You got to love John L., right? Sure. I mean, he he brought a lot of fun and joy. Maybe not a, not as much good coaching, you know, as, <laughs> as Michigan State fans wanted. But he, he, was, he was a character, wasn't he? Right. And it wasn't the game. It, this game was kind of a snoozer in the shoe, which we both covered our fair share of those. Um, yeah. It wasn't the halftime explosion of, of two years later. Yeah. yeah oh, five years yeah. later where he exploded at halftime after the coaches football. are screwing it up. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So there isn't, like I said, well, we brought you on for some Tennessee talk and you know what? Go, go figure. We'll start with a former Michigan guy, uh, Joe Milton, who I think has been in college forever but now he's become this legend for throwing the football 90 yards the orange bull was a heck of a performance so i mean how real is this hype around him and, and how does he do you think he will be accurate maybe not on the hendon hooker level but that was always the knock right how has he improved his accuracy in this offense yeah i mean it's fascinating bill uh Joe Milton this year, like you said, I mean, there was a lot of excitement for Joe Milton in 2020 at Michigan. And that first game he goes out at Minnesota and looks fantastic. He's like, oh, yeah, they've got something. You know, they, I didn't know at the time. I think, you know, people caught up later. I think it was like the third play of the next week. They lose that game to Michigan State, but he got his thumb like ripped out of its socket or the like kind of frack or whatever. So he was messed up the rest of that year. But still, he wasn't good enough, right? And even at Tennessee – he is Josh Heupel's choice to be the quarterback two years ago, and he, he's, he's okay. He makes some amazing plays. 
like you said, the accuracy, especially on the deep ball, that's the big thing with Joe Milton. Is you got to like it's a flat. Yeah, you can throw it a mile, but you got to be able to put touch on it and all that. So then he gets replaced by Hennon Hooker. My short answer to your question is: I, I think it's unrealistic for people to expect Joe Milton to come in and perform the way Hendon Hooker did. Hendon Hooker, like I just don't think Josh Heupel. It, we've seen at Tennessee, I think in particular, he's really good at designing offense, game plans, play calling, developing quarterbacks, all that. But I also think Hendon Hooker will still stand out as exceptional a few years from now in, in what he did in two years. He was just he was a spectacular player. And um, in some ways, Joe Milton, I mean, there's a reason Joe Milton won the job from him, right? I mean, he's just, he's an inc- huge athlete. He can do everything, he can do things that most, a lot of quarterbacks can't do. But I don't know the answer to your question, Bill. W- will he be consistently efficient enough? I think one big difference between those two guys, you know, Hendon Hooker had a really good feel in the pocket and with quick feet and escapability, and he was an effective runner out of the pocket. Milton, if he gets some momentum coming downhill, I mean, he's he's a, a, a threat, but he is, from what I've seen, he doesn't have that same feel and doesn't have the quick feet. And so um, it's just going to be fascinating. I, I've said this too, guys. Like, I can see Joe Milton after this season being a top 10 NFL pick. Like, I think he has that kind of ability. I could also see him – being an afterthought in the draft. I mean, I really like, I think the range of possibility for him in the NFL is so like he's someone's going to be enamored with what he brings, no matter what happens this season, but he's got to prove that he can be a winning, efficient, effective, consistent quarterback. And we have not seen that yet. Speaking of Tennessee quarterbacks, we have a feature on the show called Trochi trivia where I try to stump bill, uh, each week, I, I ask the question, and at the end of the show, we try to answer it. Now, I want to include you in the Trochi Trivia this week, Joe. Last week, we had Matt Fortuna on. He and Bill went head-to-head, battled it to a draw. And so yeah. I want to see how you can handle it. Uh, it's focused on a certain Tennessee quarterback. 1994, Peyton Manning, true freshman. His first game was at UCLA. Uh, he was on his first game of his career, okay? But balls went out to UCLA. And three quarterbacks for the Vols played. Peyton Manning did not play in that opening game. Can you name the three quarterbacks that played ahead of Peyton Manning oh. before he took the job a few games later? Think about it, and we will revisit at the end of the show. So uh, Matt and Bill had fun last week with it. We'll see what happens at the end of the show this week. So Bill ranks the college football coaches. Each summer, one to thirty, one to one hundred and thirty-three. He's got Josh Heupel in the top ten. You agree with that? Well, I need to look at the list. I I think that that's I, that off the t- cuff. That sounds a little high. Um, but look, he's been impressive. And there's no doubt. And mm-hmm. I, I, I raised my hand when they hired him. I was like, oh. like you know, UCF kind of recruiting hasn't been great with him, and um. You know, I just I, I was underwhelmed by the hire. And like I said, I, I think he's he's really, really good as an offensive coach. And obviously the, the story with, with Josh Heupel goes back to Oklahoma kind of looking to pivot to this Baylor offense, but you know, kind of being scapegoated there um at the end of his career there and then kind of reinventing himself with this offense. And of course, he did great things at Missouri with it. But also, like those teams, you know, they, they, they did get a lot of empty calories. They fattened up on some weaker opponents. And when they played really good defenses, you know, they tended to, you know, dip dramatically in production. So I wondered about that, too, at Tennessee. And look, two straight years now, we have seen Georgia come out and, and, and have the answers, unlike anybody else. It was amazing last year to see Alabama have none and to see Georgia have all of them, right? <laughs> I mean, really, it's what it was. So he still has to, you know, you got to prove that you can go beat a team like that and that you can get your, and you cannot have a game like South Carolina last year, which was just a complete meltdown. But he's good. He's very good. I'm impressed. And look, I, I think that uh, the recruiting, and we know that right now recruiting is almost, it's almost hard to like judge it the same way because it's like, how good is your collective? And Tennessee's was on the cutting edge. 
but they're recruiting defensive talent at a high level too. And so I'm really interested to see, you know, Tim Banks, what, how, how good can you get that defense? You don't have to be great to be a championship level team with this offense, but how good can you get that defense? But I think he has a really good way with, with players. Um, He's got a good balance. And it's also just the contrast between him and recent Tennessee coaches, like just, it's pretty stark, right? Like, it's just like a guy, like a normal guy you can talk to. And like, it, like it, there was so many, when you think about Butch and Pruitt and, and Dooley, I mean, go back to Lane if you want. It's just been a circus. Right. It's, and, a, it's uh, not the easiest place to coach either. It's not for sure. But, and that's the thing I wondered with him because he was always seemed like a guy, you know, kind of a little bit reclusive in terms of, you know, not out there like to talk a lot and stuff like that, but he just got a nice, consistent demeanor, and I think mm-hmm. it has rubbed off in the program. It's got the adult in the room kind of thing with him, you know. <laughs> but I still think—I mean, he still has some things to prove, right? I mean, he, like we still have to see it at, at the highest level and consistently for a season. Um, I do think that uh, you know this year is going to be really interesting. But I, I think the next couple of years with Nico Yamaliava as quarterback. That's, those are Tennessee teams that should, to me, should be right there for playoff purse. Expanded well, that, playoff purse, of course. Well, I'm glad you pronounced his last name so I didn't have to. So <laughs> I'm just going to say that's like the one I used to do with Tua or, you know, uh, well, I got Troy uh, with the Steelers, right? So, uh, Paul Malu? Yeah, there you Paul go. Paul I, I, I let everybody else do it first. So, uh, well, Troy, I, yeah. so with Troy, me, sorry. I was going to say Troy is too, like Troy's too kind of like Tua and Nico at least are like kind of like names that can stand alone, but Troy's right. tough, you know? Yeah, yeah. Troy, you're like Troy <laughs> with the Steelers. And uh, no, I, I uh, mispronounced that one a couple times. So, well, I was going to ask you about Nico. So when you have the five-star quarterback and the fascination with one, and, and Bill, it's funny that Bill mentioned that with the Trochi trivia because you know that, so what are Tennessee fans looking for him? And, how many meaningful snaps is he meaningful snaps is he going to play? Do you think, or is this a deal where he is the straight up backup unless something happens? Yeah, it's a good question, Bill. I, I had, you know, I, I was very interested in this. <laughs> I remember like a year ago, I think I, I think I wrote something about, I wrote about Milton hooker, the athletic. And I basically wrote like Joe Milton is the favorite to be the starter next year. And Tennessee fans are like, you shut your mouth right now. It is Nico, <laughs> Nico, Nico. <laughs> And the crazy thing is, like, even after the Orange Bowl, like, uh, and Joe, you know, he, he was very good overall. He's MVP of the Orange Bowl. It was a very – it was an encouraging performance. Even after that, like, at the media hotel later, a Tennessee fan came up to me and was like, so, Nico's going to be the guy, right? I'm like, Dude, he's like hey, what are you doing? You know, so the, from the fan perspective, the first time that, you know, Joe Milton doesn't play great, there's going to be noise. But right. if you really – Look at how Nico has approached this. I think in his mind, he's getting this year to be the backup quarterback. And I, I think that I think that's the plan. I think it's plan from his perspective. That said, you listen to what some of the coaches have said about him during camp. They've been very, very happy with what he did over the summer. And so look, I mean, if Tennessee loses a game or two that it shouldn't and Joe Milton is struggling and I don't think you can count it out they, they don't want that to happen I think ideally he's he's able to to have that year like some of the great quarterbacks we've seen at other places what Stroud had a year right Young had a year and then he's ready to go next year but I can't rule it out because I just I still don't know if Joe Milton is going to be able to string it together consistently week after week I'm looking at Tennessee September. They got five games. Uh, none of them are against ranked opponents. Um, do you see a tester in there? They got to go down to Florida, but Florida, I don't – looking at on paper, they don't look very good this year. Uh, they could struggle to make a bowl game, I think. Uh, one thing that might be a little interesting, visiting Knoxville is UTSA. They've uh, been a fairly consistent group of five wow. team. Might catch him napping after the Florida game. I don't know. What do you when you look at September? What stands out to you for the Vols? Yeah, no, Bill. I I, I was gonna say UTSA is the sneaky, interesting game. Now, mm. now, granted, September thirtieth is South Carolina, and some people really think they're gonna be good. I mean, Rattler and you know, I, I mean, they've got some momentum, and they just 
dusted Tennessee's defense. So that's a huge game for the Vols in terms of, you know, wanting to get them back. I mean, I think that could be competitive. I think those three in a row have a chance um, because you're right. I don't think Florida's very good this year, but there's just weird stuff with Tennessee, Florida, isn't there? (laughs) And and, uh, it's a primetime game in Gainesville. And, you know, it's – so I'm not – I'm not just expecting the balls to show up and win by 20 and, and get on the bus early. You know, I, I, I think they'll win that game. They badly need to win that game. When you have an opportunity like this against Florida, you know, last year they beat them, even with Anthony Richardson actually playing very well in that game. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think, I think those three are, are, are worth watching. You know, the opener, unfortunately, I don't think is going to be much of a show other than – for the balls fans in, in Nashville at Nissan stadium want to watch touchdowns, but that's probably not going to go very well for Virginia. I was going to ask a question about the sec nine game schedule, but I'm not going to do it. But I mean, because the big 10 has 20, 18 to 20 teams. Now that's going to change. So here's my question. It's kind of a throwback is I've seen the picture of the guy with the cigar after the Tennessee Alabama game, maybe a million times. What's your most, were you, you were at that game, right? So like, what was your yeah. most vivid memory from that moment, that night? Like, was there something you saw that we didn't see that you were like, Oh, that was pretty funny. Well, I will say you mentioned the the cigar you're outside. I mean, it's, you know, we're outside and, and I felt like I was at like a, nightclub in the 30s and everybody's smoking unfiltered <laughs> palm malls like i couldn't breathe out there it was insane i was like trying to interview guys and stuff because you know it's just chaos in the field but it was like oh god <laughs> you know so uh yeah i tell you what people had had those cigars right like i've been at alabama or I, even at, at knoxville when like alabama wins that's fewer people but like i've been in alabama for wins over tennessee and they you know, they have the cigars and it's yeah it's tradition and we just killed them again but i swear everybody here had like five on their person and we're just like <laughs> just you know fill your mouth and light them all i mean <laughs> but i can't i mean the obvious like the the goal posts you know going out and our david Ubb and my my colleague yeah have he he picked the the smart assignments like i would if those goal posts are out i am following them all night so he did that for a really cool story but for the most part it was just just the jubilation. I mean, that place was uh, – that was one of the best atmospheres I've ever seen for sure. And, and just games. It was so – I mean, they they should have lost the game. I mean, Alabama screwed it up with offensively. At the end, of it, even just Gibbs just dropping that one pass, that's probably the winning field goal for them. So, for them to pull that out, truly a remarkable uh, outcome. And, yeah, one of, the, one of the best atmospheres I've been at in college football. And that's saying something because I'm old. <laughs> it was a game of the year, no, well, no doubt, nationally. And it was uh, such a enduring image of the whole season was, those, was that afternoon in Knoxville. I got a couple of Vanderbilt questions for you. Yeah. All right. I know you've been going to, to a few scrimmages and stuff. Wanted to ask you about two guys, one on offense, one on defense. Will Shepard, uh, wide receiver, put up you know good numbers the last two years. Uh, seems like he's, you know, that, that Vanderbilt – athlete that can hang with other sec dbs out there and, and make plays um are they gonna do they have enough depth around him to kind of take a little heat off him if a team says we're not letting will shepherd beat us this year uh and the second guy i wanted to ask was prince collie a linebacker the transfer from notre dame he uh was it came down to notre dame in tennessee i'm mean, sorry notre dame and vanderbilt when uh when he was coming out of high school and Clark Lee got him to go to, to Notre Dame. He, he never cracked the starting lineup in those two years there. Transferred to Vanderbilt this year. How's he developing in the fall? Uh, and, and uh, you know, what are you hearing about his playing time this fall? Yeah, well, on, on that one, that's really interesting because they're actually loaded at linebacker. You know, Ethan Barr has been hurt. So there's been opportunities for other guys. A guy who's just jumps at you is Langston Patterson, Kane Patterson's brother making plays all over the place. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there's, you know, I can't say I saw a ton from Prince Collie, but certainly there's excitement about him and they feel like they actually have legitimate D one guys and depth there. I just think, I mean, first of all, just overall with Vanderbilt in the trenches, it is obvious. I mean, it's only year three, but uh, like Vanderbilt, 
and I think any power five school should be able to do this has been able to have some skill guys who can compete, like you said, Bill, with anybody. And yes, Will Shepard's absolutely one of those guys. And they got some freshmen coming in who I like a lot at receiver, not to mention, you know, Jada McGowan is a sophomore. I think that they have a legit SEC receiver room. But up front, and I'm not saying they're ready to hang with whoever in the SEC, but it's been a pretty dramatic uptick in the short period of time from Clark Lee to the point where, and I think they have a really good offensive line coach, but even on the, on the other side of the ball to the point where it's like, okay, they can actually hang in now um, most Saturdays. Like I'm interested, you know, I, I think they could be better this year and they might not win the six games, get to a bowl game. I think that's very possible. But I'm interested. I think where you'll see a difference, I do think you'll see a difference when they play the best of the best on their schedule. It's not going to be like a joke game where it's like, you know, Georgia touchdowns exceed Vanderbilt yards or whatever. Right? You know, like like right. I actually they think got, they're going to be competitive. They got blown out several times last year when they played. I mean, Alabama, yes. Georgia, Tennessee, like the good teams, but still, it, they weren't they weren't competitive. So that that's an area you got to watch. Yeah, and I'm not saying again. I'm I'm calling for close games there, but but I think closer. Uh, yeah, I think they they're, they're going to look more like an SEC football team. It, it's actually it's it's pretty impressive to me what Clark Lee has done with a very diff, as as you know, not just a difficult job, but the the circumstances that he specifically took over. So, um, and then you know I think a lot of the season will come down to AJ Swan. He's a talented quarterback. Can he be consistent? What from what I've seen, Ken Seals, and it might be as I mean, it's one of the best backup situations anywhere, right? Like Ken Seals, it, there's not that much difference. So if they have to go that way, I think they could be okay, or maybe even better than okay with Ken Seals. Well, before we do the trivia, can I launch a preemptive strike on Joe? Because I know where he's from and where he's at. And I was at Big Ten Media Day around all the Michigan and Michigan State writers launching a strike at the Detroit Lions. Because you know I'm a Green Bay fan and you know I'm an arrogant Green Bay fan. So are you going to be mad when Jordan Love destroys all that Lions hype this season? (laughs) So uh, one, th- one thing that I love to do on my radio show is make fun of the Lions. I'll tell the quick story. When Barry Sanders retired, the Lions brought me so much misery in my life. It's incredible. Um, when Barry Sanders retired in 99, I said, I'm going to spend the rest of my life making fun of the Lions. And it has been a, such a wonderful life change. So I'm, Bill, I know for a fact the Lions are going to blow this. Like, it's so obvious. They are going to – they're going to go like 6-11 and 11, all this hype. Oh my gosh. It's, and I feel bad because I have family and friends who like actually believe right now. I'm like, can we look at decades of evidence? My uncle Bill was an eight year old in Canton, Ohio. Who got to talk trash at school when the Lions beat the Cleveland Browns for the NFL championship in 1957. <laughs> and he's still devoted to them, but it's like, okay, at least he's seen evidence in his life. Like I, I, I can, I can respect that. Too many people are not looking at the, uh, you know, read the tea leaves. They are going to blow it. So Go pack. Go pack. Go. Go. Yeah. See, <laughs> like, go. That's my buddies here in Ohio. They're all Bengals Burroughs guys. And they said, my entitlement's over. You're done. You're, you, you're just a normal football fan now. And I said, because yes, I am a very arrogant Packers fan. We went down Friday, Joe, and took my son down to the preseason game. And there were a lot of Bengals fans there. So a lot of excitement around Burrow. And yeah. um, okay, well, I'll let Bill do the trivia. And yeah. I'm, what's the format of the answer here, Bill? Uh, we'll let, we'll let maybe Joe try to name one. Then you can try to name one. Then Joe can try to name one. I guess it's three quarterbacks that played for Tennessee against UCLA in the opening game in 1994 while Peyton Manning sat on the bench and waited his turn. Joe first up. Yeah. You know, I I think at least a couple of these names, I'm going to be like, Oh my gosh, you idiot. (laughs) Am I crazy in thinking that Todd Helton is one of them? Todd Helton was one. You are. All right. I'll take my one then. I I, I got There you go. Todd Helton came off the bench after the starter was injured. I know who the starter is, but I don't know the third guy. So I'm going to even Joe out and see if he knows the other one. It's a cool quit. Jerry Cole quick. Correct. The, the oh, starter. Did nice. he break his leg? Was it a leg injury or something? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think a knee injury. Yeah. Yes. So Helton but, came in and then he struggled. And then they actually, so I'm assuming neither of you know 
the, the there's third, a third guy. I have no third idea. Third guy. So he was in Peyton's class. Brandon Stewart. Yeah, I wouldn't Brandon Stewart one. got the nod ahead of Peyton Manning. So. We get we get full credit for two or three. Though. <laughs> that, that third That's not bad. Again, you were fought uh, to a draw. We got another draw here in Trophy <laughs> Trivia with the guests. We, get, yeah. we get some credit for that because there's no I don't know who that guy is. <laughs> I, I feel yeah. fine about that. So yeah. here, here, okay, see if I remember this. So I, I know Peyton at some point that year did, or did you say it already, Bill? It was at the Florida game that he finally came out. I, I thought it was like Mississippi State or something. Right. That was his first start, I think. The next week they played Georgia. He did get snaps against Georgia. And they okay, won. so Georgia. Okay. They won okay. big 41 23. Peyton got a few snaps, but Helton was the starter for that game. Yeah. Was the UCLA a home game? No, it was in the Rose Bowl. So the I remember watching it, then it wasn't that game. It was a different game where he took his first snaps at Neyland, and you always. You you heard like the craziness of the crowd. I wonder if you'll get the same thing with Nico this year. That little five star bump that they get when they take their first snap. So uh, I'm sure you'll hear that. I'm sure Joe Milton will appreciate it. But uh, Joe and <laughs> Joe and I are a good team. We know what we're doing. Yeah, we'll so. take two out of three. Ain't bad. We'll take that. Yeah, well done. Well done. Hard. All right. Well, thank you, Joe. Hopefully, we can uh, see you again sometime during the season. Uh, thanks to everybody for listening to the CFB Nation All America Podcast, brought to you by Twisted Tea. Enjoy the rest of the day, and uh, we will see you soon.